talk a little bit about about his career from the start of becoming, you know, a member of the armed forces, and then how he was captured, and you know sure. what what he went through because it's an absolutely incredible story. It is. It is an incredible. So, um, Arthur Lee Shreve was born in Baltimore City in uh, 1897. How old does that make me? Um, but basically, he, he lived a pretty normal life up until about 1913, and that's when he sprung into action. And the reason he sprung into action is because his father suddenly died of acute pneumonia. And my grandfather always had this ability to um, follow through with, with the right action at the right time and, and carry it through. And he ended up going to work for his mother. In other words, he had three other siblings and a mother, and they didn't have any income. So he had to go to work, which he did. But by 1917, with World War I raging on, he decided that he needed to do more. And so he signed up for the Maryland National Guard in 1917. Now, he was a high school dropout at this point because he dropped out just several weeks before he was due to graduate from Baltimore Polytechnic. So he's a high school dropout. He's a Mustang. He's an enlisted man now with no West Point, no college, no nothing. So he quickly, as he joined the National Guard, he quickly knew that he wanted to fly. So he transferred to the Signal Corps and the aviation section. When that happened, they sent him to Alabama somewhere, and then they sent him to the University of Illinois for flight school. And at the end of 19, wait, in 1918, he graduated at the end of that year, and they sent him to Issoudun, France, to fly for the sec second Aero Squadron. Now, people have to remember, in World War I, airplanes were new, and they'd never used them for war before, and the average length of a pilot's life was only 50 hours, which is a matter of weeks. My grandfather's twin brother was the first aviator killed there in France. He was part of the Yale unit. And wow. uh, my, my mother always said it's because the plane that they were making them all fly it had a design flaw. And a lot of people were killed. He was the first. And there was no parachutes. So anyway, so my grandfather flew for the second Aero Squadron for eight months, <laughs> survived it, and came back to Baltimore in February 1919. And, um, and, and anybody in Baltimore will appreciate that. He went back to work as a surveyor for the biggest construction company in the East, and that was uh, Whiting Turner as a surveyor for a year. And I even have a letter from 1920 from G.W. Whiting himself saying, please don't go to the Army, because after a year with Whiting Turner, he wanted to go back to the Army. And, and G.W. wrote him a letter saying, you've been such a wonderful employee. We, we, we're going to miss you because you did such a great job with large numbers of men. But anyway, 1920, Arthur goes back to the military, to the US Army, and signs up again July 1920. And he's now a second lieutenant and, um, you know, gets right into it. His first assignment is Honolulu, Hawaiian Territory. It wasn't even a state back then. Under General George, under Charles Summerall in Honolulu at Fort Shafter. Now, he gets to Fort Shafter and he's quickly transferred over to um, Schofield Barracks because uh, General Kuhn wants him as his aide-de-camp. But the thing that was so interesting about Hawaii for Arthur is threefold. One is he happens to meet my grandmother there uh, as she's on vacation all the way from Jamestown Island in 1921. They have a chance meeting and they fall in love. So that's number one. Number two is Arthur is already very interested in war tactics, but Summerall is already beefing up Pearl Harbor. And, and my grandfather being in the artillery um, learns so much about the coast artillery and about Japanese war tactics. Summerall is already beefing up Pearl because they already know it's the gateway to the Pacific, the mouse trap, as they say. The mouse trap, either the Japanese are going to catch us there or we'll catch them. So he already is cued into this, and he also learns the Japanese way, you know, Yamadi Damashi and, and saving face and everything about the Japanese um, and their culture. He also must have learned some of the language. So these are very key pieces which come later. Um, now, in 1925, he's sent back to the United States. He marries my grandmother in 26. They have two sons in the 30s. But in the next 20 years, my grandfather 
does it all in the U.S. Army. He's on the U.S. Jar Army and Jumping and Polo team. He is uh, teaches war tactics at the University of Oklahoma. He is, graduates from Command and General Staff School, Advanced Horsemanship, uh, Military Tactics. I mean, so when he retires in 1940, he's a lieutenant colonel, and he goes back to his farm in Maryland and retires, or at least he thinks he's going to retire. And then he gets a telegram in 1941, June, uh, called back to service, uh, South Luzon Force General George Parker uh, as Chief of Artillery. So he's sent there um, in uh, November. He arrives November 28, uh, 1941. And of course, we all know what happens after that. My grandfather was not fooled, though. He already knew, you know, in the Philippines, everybody thought it was the Pearl of the Orient. Well, he already knew that, yeah, mm, not so much. You know, Japanese, <laughs> oh, not so much. So we could get attacked here at any moment. And of course, they were. Pearl Harbor, he was in the thick of it when Pearl Harbor happened. He got the call. Uh, and after that, you know, he was put on high alert. And, he, and I think I said this last time, but he went around the island looking at the artillery positions on the coast and uh, knew right away that there was this one area called Antimonon Bay on the east side facing Honolulu that he, it was a perfect setup for the Japanese to swoop in, which their main tactic is surprise. It was a peninsula in this bay. And of course, he went right back to George Parker and, and, um, and Colonel Williams and the gang and said that, you know, we've, our back door is open down there. We've got to do something. Um, However, they didn't have the guns. They even sent him a, as a personal representative to uh, General MacArthur, and they just didn't have the guns. Well, you know, in the wee hours of December 24th, 1941, my grandfather goes to Antimonon at 4 a.m. in the morning looking for his reconnaissance op officer, and lo and behold, he's asleep in this hotel on the hillside overlooking the, the bay. He roused this guy out of his sleep, Lieutenant Lightfoot, and a Filipino woman in the background yells, uh, look, and they all look out the window, and sure enough, a hu two huge Japanese aircraft carriers, destroyers, and cruisers, and 40 transport boats come around this peninsula, even though the Navy said it was too shallow for a large uh, reinforced landing. And so now the, the fall of the time begins in earnest. And of course, my grandfather was right. So, you know, fast forward, uh, you know, a lot of things happen to him, but he, he has appendicitis. He, he's evacuated out of a field hospital while he's not well. And because of that, he gets trucked on the Bataan Death March. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, people are going to have to read the book. It's just, it's just so, you know, the things just happen one after the other, but the, the man just survives it all.